Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Matt Britton. I am the CEO of Suzy. Um, I hope everyone here can hear the audio. I just saw somebody uh, ask if they can hear the audio. I'm assuming you can, or my team will let me know. Great. Thanks, Abel. Uh, I'm Matt Britton, the CEO of Suzy. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, State of Change, Five Industries Facing Continued Consumer-Driven Disruption. I am joined today by a special guest and a good friend of mine, Jeff Cologne. Jeff, why don't you pop in from cyberspace? Here you are. That was quick and easy. <laughs> Head of Brand Studio uh, at Microsoft Advertising. Good to see you, Jeff. Good to see you, uh, too, Matt. Thanks for having me. And you are in Seattle right now? I am in Seattle, yes. Okay, and how's the weather in Seattle this time of year? Uh, it's getting better. Let's all right, just good. say that. Yeah, good. starting to be outside a little bit more. Well, I miss certainly miss all my time out there in the Pacific Northwest with uh, with you and all your colleagues. So um, it's good to see you again. And really looking forward to today's webinar. Um, this webinar is the culmination of a pretty comprehensive research study um, that Susie partnered on uh, with Microsoft Advertising called State of the Five. And the impetus behind State of the Five is really to identify five key industries that were really facing sort of disproportionate consumer-driven disruption. Um, obviously, we've been through, um, you know, quite a year. Uh, in fact, I think we're almost today to the date, one year ago, when all the craziness, the you know, started to hit the fan, so to speak. Um, we all remember that night. I think it was March 6th or 7th when, um, you know, it was announced that Tom Hanks contacted COVID and the NBA started canceling games. And then all of a sudden we went from a, what is this going to be to, oh my God, this is going to be something that like you've never seen before. And here we are a year later, um, still on Zoom, still talking to people remotely um, and still talking about disruption because I think disruption is something that we're really just starting to see the beginning of as a result of this pandemic. We're certainly not the end of it. Certainly some trends will come and go, but many will be here for good. So today we're going to be speaking about five uh, categories that we we think, again, disproportionately um, have been disrupted. And it's going to be more of a discussion between Jeff and I uh, based upon the insights and learnings from the study and really what we're seeing um, in culture, in business um, and society at large that we should look out for to really have us better prepared uh, for what the future may look like. And those five categories are travel, um, who doesn't want to travel right now, right? Uh, retail, health and wellness, technology, and finance. We're going to go deep into all of these. Um, and we are going to also have room for Q&A at the end. So if you have questions, um, please uh, post them, uh, you know, on the on the window to or I believe it should be to your right. Um, and time permitting at the end, uh, Jeff and I will dive into them and we'll go from there. So um, let's dive into our first category, travel. Uh, travel is obviously a very hot topic right now. Um, people are really, you know, so yearning to switch from what I call a comfort state, which they've been deep in during the pandemic. And what I mean by a comfort state is everyone's wearing their Lululemon sweatpants, right? Savings rates in the U.S. on average are um, at an all-time high. Uh, people have never had this much money in the bank. Not, you know, obviously there are some sectors of the economy that are really struggling, but overall the data shows that consumers um, have record savings right now. People have had more time than they've ever really known what to do with. And entering this time was the one thing we couldn't like, capture enough of, right? And we spent time with family and there's a lot that's kind of come from the comfort side, but it's come at the expense of adventure and excitement. People have not been going to dinners. They have not even been going to the office. They haven't been traveling. There's been no serendipity, lack of new romantic relationships, all these things that consumers are, in, you know, that, that they're facing. And the question is, you know, once this, this pandemic starts to clear up and we, we get to some semblance of normal, how much of a whiplash would there be from going from that comfort state to an excitement state? And travel is really the category where, that, where a lot of that question lies. Um, consumers have a fear of missing out. Uh, what we learned from our study, which really conflicts with their feelings of personal responsibility. People don't really know when it's safe to travel. They don't really know when they're going to be able to be on an airplane without a mask again. Uh, they don't know if it's okay for them to even be in an airport right now. So they have a fear of missing out. They want to get out again, but there's still this sort of fear kind of pulling them back. Nearly half of consumers agree that safety concerns are making them more hesitant, even if they're vaccinated. And again, it's going to be kind of one of these wait and see things. There's not going to be, um, you know, a light switch that flips on in America where someone says, OK, go back to normal again. We're already seeing states like Texas already remove mask mandates. Um, it's obviously not going to be uniformed in this divided nation we have right now in terms of direction um, for municipalities. A lot 
lot of consumers are going to be left to their own devices on when it's safe to do things once again. Uh, this is a quote we uncovered from our joint study. Traveling in next year or so isn't the top priority for me right now. Health and safety are. My priorities in traveling can wait until things start getting better. So again, you kind of still have this mixed bag. And one overwhelming thing that popped up is that the consumers that did want to travel really are more focused on domestic travel um, because obviously the fear of the unknown of traveling overseas is still quite prevalent, despite the fact that some nations around the world are, you know, are even further along in the recovery than we are. I think there's a sense of uh, unease of being away from home and away from, um, you know, consumers, loved ones. And because of that, they're really veering towards more domestic travel. So, I mean, Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you. How do you think consumers, what are the implications of what we learned during the study uh, in terms of how consumers are thinking about travel overall? Yeah, I think uh, two things that came from the study is a lot of people are planning travel. So, you know, Matt, we know that they may not know when they actually get on a plane or go on a trip, but they're planning travel. So I think for a lot of um, a lot of us, that means that um, it, it's a good time to actually, if you're in the travel industry or you sort of support the travel industry, to figure out how to reach a lot of those yeah. Uh, consumers. The other thing is what, what we found is people are yearning for nostalgia again, based on that travel, because as you, as we've noted from the study there, there may be fear of going somewhere new. They're probably looking at places they've gone in the past as that first trip. Yeah. I think later down the line, we'll, we'll go on bucket list trips that we, you know, to destinations we've always dreamed of. But I think those first initial trips will be to places that many people have already gone before. So that means for, again, if you have a list of people who've already visited your location, it's probably a good time to hit them up just because we're on sort of this nostalgia well, trip. I, uh, I, when I it think comes to your it. point with nostalgia, it's also going to be about family. I mean, many yes. people, yeah. we're in a world right now where it's been so transient over the last 20 years. So many people, I have two brothers that both live in California and I haven't seen them in over a year and I haven't seen their kids they were my nieces and nephews the first trip I'm going to take is to go see them, right? So I yeah. think a lot of people are going to be traveling domestically, not necessarily to go do something so amazing, but they want to see family. That's what people yeah. value and what they think is important. Um, yeah. I think there's a lot of implications to a, a, a really refined focus on domestic travel. Um, I think a company like Airbnb uh, is going to absolutely boom during this for a couple of reasons. A, you know, from a domestic standpoint, they're everywhere that you would want to be. Um, B, some of the maybe health and safety concerns that consumers might have with being in a lobby or being in an elevator at a hotel don't really exist uh, with Airbnb. And it's also for on the on the supplier or host side, it's a great incremental revenue opportunity. So I think uh, as it's an established company, more consumers are going to be willing to let others stay in their home. So um, I think Airbnb is going to be huge. The other thing um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it is I think domestic travel um, in demand to me is a good thing for the auto industry. So for a very long time, we were saying with urbanization, with millennials living in cities, that them buying a car is not really as important anymore because you have the ease and ubiquity of something like Uber, um, where you can go anywhere you want to go. And while I think Uber and Lyft are certainly going to make um, a comeback, I think not as much so as the, as the auto manufacturers. I think m many consumers are moving out of primary cities like San Francisco and New York to maybe secondary cities like Austin or Charlotte, where it's easier to have a car. And if you're going to be traveling more domestic, I think that now becomes almost a mandate. So what are your thoughts, A, on Airbnb, Jeff? And what are your thoughts, B, on sort of this renaissance of the auto industry coming out of this? Yeah, I think Airbnb will do very, very well just based on, the, on, on what you've said, um, the fact that some people might just – want to stay in places for a longer period of time. We know Airbnb facilitates that sometimes a little bit better than staying in a hotel and, and also some of the safety reasons. There's healthy hesitation here, you know, Matt, when it comes to, I think, those initial trips. And then on the car side, I, I, I totally agree. I think if you have more people in secondary and tertiary cities, you, you need a car to get around. There, yeah. there, there isn't really the public transportation that you find in some of our primary cities uh, right. around the world. So that, that is another thing that people will have to think about, um, you know, as, as people continue to make those moves into uh, suburban locations and probably will never move back to those primary locations if their employer says, hey, you can work from anywhere moving which forward, many, which many companies have already announced. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be really interesting. And I think the other aspect of travel 
that definitely is up in the air right now is what is the future of business travel? You know, I can tell you that, um, you know, I'm thankful that our company, Suzy, has performed incredibly well um, during this pandemic, not only because we have an amazing team, but because we pivoted very fast to being a remote organization and really a, a, a company that put digital marketing at its center. We obviously knew we couldn't visit customers. We couldn't go to big conferences, et cetera. And we've because of it, really pivoted to quite an efficient model where coming out of this, I'm going to think twice about sending 20 people to South by Southwest at a consumer electronic show. While I value the, the you know, the one-on-one -on -one personal relationships that can be built, I'm just not quite so sure that it's worth it, you know, to, to, to send our employees there. So what are your thoughts on that, Jeff, in terms of business travel and the efficiency coming out of it and what consumers get, what, what business should should expect in terms of how that's going to come back. I think we'll move into a period which was similar to the uh, post recession of uh, the dot com bust in the early 2000s. You had to have a reason for getting on a trip uh, on a plane to travel. So I think we will see that, Matt, where, uh, you know, someone might say you have to you have to have a, a, a thorough reason for actually traveling. Otherwise, you know, you can rely on Teams or Zoom or other digital um, uh, sort of methods to speak to clients and customers. I do think, though, there will be um, big events that are earmarked for travel, just because we know, as you as you mentioned, serendipity, being able to bump into people who you know you can do business arrangements or business development deals with. That's important. I just think that p companies will send a lot smaller amounts of team to some of those events. Um, that uh, you know were massive uh, in the past. Also, I think those events will keep a hybrid model, meaning you know moving forward, consumer electronic showcase. If you want to go to Vegas, you can, but if you want to sign up for a digital ticket, I think they'll still continue to offer that. There's no way we're going back to, hey, you have to be there in person moving forward. Looks like we're having some slight technical if difficulties here, Jeff. Um, Jeff, I, you know, I'm kind of curious from your perspective, are there certain events that you're going to prioritize having your team go to in person uh, versus maybe some of the other things? Yeah, I think, you know, if you look at uh, what's on calendar, what's on a calendar for, um, you know, the events within my industry, I, I, I think, you know, down the line when it comes to things in, you know, 2022, which might seem like, wait, that's another year from now, but probably when most events will, will allow for, you know, full registration, you know, I'll probably go back to Consumer Electronics Showcase again. I thought the virtual event they hosted this year was was good. One thing that's yeah. different, difficult is you can't do demos. You can't see a lot of the uh, technology or, or sort of like, you know, use that technology as you would in a virtual space. Um, you know, I, I also think, you know, going back to, you know, canned lines is a, is a good thing in terms of being able to see, you know, a lot of people that business deals might happen. But that that probably will be a shorter list than in years past where maybe I would have attended, uh, attended you know, 15, possibly 20 events to speak at or to meet people. That list might be closer to, you know, three to four moving forward and then also just asking a lot of these in-person events can i present you know virtually rather than in person just so i don't have to go to an airport fly somewhere to present and uh you know requires a lot of things um in terms of, of scheduling so that's that's one i think good, good thing we, we may see from a result of this yeah I, I mean i think for me what's been the most interesting is um, you know, the ability to just like see content from all over the world, right? So I'm not just, you know, stuck watching things on the US, but if there's a really incredible speaker, um, you know, that that's speaking in the UK or something like that, like now we have this full opportunity to see it. So um, hopefully some of the things that we see now in, in digital, um, you know, continue forward. Um, what are the things that you hope really stick around from from kind of digital events? I mean, I think the big thing is, as you noted, there's the ability now to, you know, anybody could be a speaker at an event. There's no more, I think, worry about or shouldn't be a worry about, hey, we're only going to book these people to 
talk at an event because of the uh, of the virtual you know capabilities that means you get a larger mix of people that are that are speaking at these events which is i think always good you get a lot of you know sort of diversity that that's uh that's at uh, at an event um i think the the big thing you know moving forward will just be for those who decide not to go to physical events you know how do you make that virtual experience uh, good in terms of of networking. I think one of the biggest things that we get from a physical event is is the networking side. So I think if they can marry those two together, we'll probably be in a you know a g- good shape moving forward. And I think it's also good for event companies. It's good for travel companies who basically can offer special deals there. So we'll see where it goes. Yeah. So it looks Jeff, like we have Matt back. Yeah, Jeff Abel didn't know this, but we're obviously grooming him to be the next webinar star. I told him, I said, at one point, Abel, in one of these webinars, I'm just going to vanish. And it's going to be up to you to step in like a backup star and just, just take us to the role. And Abel did it. I, I know. I know. Uh, I learned from the very best, Matt. I learned from the very best. But uh, I'll hop back. Computers are up a lot today, so Abel, I may need you. Uh, I may need you back. Maybe Jeff can send me one of those new uh, Microsoft Surface computers, so I don't uh, go into these issues again. So um, we're going to go into retail, uh, Jeff, and obviously retail is so very important to the fabric of American cities. Um, you know, where our office, Susie's office used to be, our lease ended, so we don't have an office right now, but Soho on Broadway used to be littered with thriving uh, retailers, specialty retailers. Now that you, we're seeing boarded up, well, um, you know, windows, and that has not recovered. And I don't know if it will recover. And unfortunately, you know, the demise of retail that was driven during the pandemic really disproportionately hit small businesses as well, um, whether it be restaurants or hardware stores. Um, you know, these these businesses that have been built for years, uh, you know, may never recover. And many of them are already out of business. So um, at the same time, you have companies like Shopify and Amazon and Wayfair and Etsy that have thrived during the pandemic um, and in some levels at the expense of these companies. So the question becomes, what happens to retail coming out of this? Um, I think one misconception that you see a lot is, uh, you know, Wall Street grouping companies like Shopify and Amazon is stay at home stocks. When the reality is that commerce before the pandemic hit was largely on mobile devices. And the last time I checked, you could shop on mobile devices away from home. So I don't think e-commerce really is part and parcel with the pandemic so much as a company like maybe Peloton, uh, where maybe their success is directly tied with it. I think it's actually quite the opposite where you see categories like grocery and consumers have gotten used to ordering grocery over Instacart and they've gotten used to the convenience in a world where they can have less time because they have more things to do. They're probably not going to go back. Right. So I think that a lot of the changes on e-commerce during the pandemic are likely here to stay. The question is, what's going to change um, coming out of it? Um, is there room for small businesses to come back, et cetera? So um, consumers on that note are torn between the convenience of digital and big box versus supporting small businesses. They realize that small businesses need support. And there is a guilt for many consumers about ordering on Amazon. You know, it's great. I can get this thing tomorrow uh, by hitting a button. But I used to buy this thing from from Joe's store downstairs. Now he's not getting this business. And, you know, so consumers are very much aware of that. Um, Consumers love online shopping. Obviously, you can read reviews, you compare prices. There's not inventory issues. You know, I entered a retailer right before the pandemic. I still remember. And the, the product was out of stock. And I had to wait for them to tell me that. Then I had to wait in line. And then I had to when I got to the cash register, they made me register for a loyalty program. And then I couldn't take it back. Meanwhile, I could have just on the way out, just ordered it online and gotten it and not had to worry. So again, convenience is a huge boost. And many consumers say, obviously, that, you know, they're shopping the established retailers like um, not just Amazon, but also more established big box retailers um, have increased, you know, companies like Walmart and Target. Costco have also benefited because um, consumers know that they're going to be able to get, uh, first of all, things like, um, you know, buy online, pick up in store, which which a lot of consumers like they can. So they have that omni channel based approach. They know they're going to probably get the best prices. They know they're going to have the inventory that they want. So, again, it was the big box retailers, the e-commerce kings who really took advantage of this, again, at the expense um, of small businesses. Although, again, so many people say it's important to support local retailers. Um, so let's talk about this, um, Jeff. Let's talk about retail and how you see retail playing out post-pandemic. Yeah, I think the big area, you know, Matt, is we can all shop online, but, you know, can we get 
necessarily the deep, um, you know, expertise that we need yeah. when it comes to a particular area. Now, granted, I know a lot of people say I, I can learn anything that I want to online by watching particular videos, but I'll, you know, I'll use an example of an area that I'm in with design. There's still a lot of people who have trouble figuring out like what blank t-shirts to print their designs on because there's yeah. not really enough good information. So what happens if, you know, in the past you may have had a, a you know, a, a storefront where you went to and you talked to that particular proprietor, you know, how that basically becomes more of an experiential sure. you know, outpost for, for a lot of these companies. That is needed in a post pandemic because of the fact that we can't always find everything that we want online. And there's not, there's also not a trust factor. There's a lot of issues. Or, or human saying, connection. Or human yes. connection, you know, like, yeah. so, I mean, shopping yeah. is something that was not just a chore, but was an activity, you know, especially, you know, yeah. People love going shopping. It was something to do. Um, I was at a mall in New Jersey two weeks ago, and it's actually more crowded than you'd ever expect it to be, even in a non-pandemic world. So people are missing it. People love going to the mall. They love walking in city streets and shopping. But I think you hit on an important point there, Jeff, which is I think coming out of this, again, consumers are going to have more money uh, relative than they've ever had before, and they're going to have far less time than they had in 2020 because their pie chart of their day is now going to be filled with leaving the house and doing more things. So yeah. because of that, the, the, the demand for shopping will be there, but the demands on people's time will be increased. And I think because of that, for a consumer to want to go into a retailer, I think the offering needs to span beyond just a product or service that's being sold. So I think it's got to be an experience, to your point, a point of emotional connection. Um, you know, it's got to be something where a consumer leaves, whether they bought something or not, and they feel like that, that, that they've been entertained or is it worth a, a use of their time? Because if it's just about the transaction, they're just going to do it on Amazon. So I think now what I question is, can a small business afford to give consumers experiences? You know what I mean? Because I do think a lot of these tech companies, whether it be Netflix, who could I could see buying a chain of movie theaters or Shopify, but I could see buying a mall and having all their low, all their merchants actually set up in the mall. You're going to have these rich tech companies coming out of this pandemic, take advantage of depressed real estate costs in major metropolitan areas to have that omni-channel approach because it's no doubt that it works. So when, does that even leave room for small businesses? So I think it's going to be incumbent on any retailer to kind of rethink what does an experience look like if I expect somebody to spend their time, their precious time um, in my establishment. Yeah, I mean, you bring up a good point with the fact that you, ha you have a lot of companies that have been sitting on a lot of capital. What, you know, they could probably go out and get a lot of commercial retail space. Oh my God, totally. Great and do some interesting things with it. I mean, I think the, the way the world will look in the retail space in the next year, you know, it, it's gonna probably surprise a lot of us. I. I have no idea what some areas might look like, but it's yeah. going to be interesting. I mean, you have also companies like Starbucks now, right, that have built their whole experience on people on laptops sitting around in their hip cafes, spending their time there. And now what they've realized is they can build a far more efficient model. Chipotle has done the same thing. McDonald's has done the same thing. Building this very sophisticated digital uh, infrastructure that stresses convenience and ease of use for consumers, where basically you pre-order, you show up, you grab it, and you go. And it doesn't impact Starbucks margins at all. In fact, it impacts. It, it's actually a positive boom in their margins because now they don't have to pay as many people, right? They don't need people sitting in their store. So I think QSR that, you know, it's not traditional retail, but I think that's going to change as well. So I think you're going to see a sea change in, in the way that retail is constructed. But going back to Netflix buying, you know, a movie theater, like I honestly think that you're going to see companies like Lululemon, who obviously broke ground with purchasing of a of an in-home fitness company, Mirror, which is a physical hardware device. I wouldn't be surprised to them, them purchase Equinox. Like, why wouldn't they do yeah. that, right? Like, yeah. so I think they could take advantage of these companies. Equinox has obviously struggled during this. People aren't going to their gyms. Lululemon's thrive. It would make, I think you're going to start to see some of those acquisitions occur for true omni-channel from these larger brands. Yeah, I would agree with that. I also think, and you know, Peloton made a move during this pandemic actually to, I think they acquired a company that allows them to get more of their um, equipment into physical yeah. infrastructure. Yeah. So this might be a case where we hear every person saying the gym is dead 
but we may actually see gyms where a Peloton device is so that yeah. you actually can use that because some they people bought, do like the serendipity. Yeah, yeah that's what it is. That's yeah, right. they bought Precore for a couple of reasons. One of which is that the demand on their company was so strong that it was taking, you know, 90 days or, or longer to get your equipment. And now they have domestic um, manufacturing capabilities. But yes, they're going to try to expand their business. So, yeah, the businesses that won uh, during this um, are going to be ones that are going to step on the gas and, and they're going to take advantage of it. And, and the, you know, so again, small businesses, you know, it's incumbent on companies that have kind of as a byproduct thrived off of small businesses, whether it be sort of like a financial services company, right? They should support small businesses like Amex Small Business Saturdays, right? It's a perfect example. I think you need more big companies doing things like that to support small businesses because otherwise, you you know, Main Street is going to look like corporate America one-on-one. And it's already yeah. started to happen. Even before the pandemic, somebody went out of business in New York City. You saw a Starbucks, a Chase or a CBS open you know, that's basically all you saw because that, those are the only companies that can afford it. On one hand, now the, the real estate costs are depressed. So maybe local businesses can, you know, afford it. But on the other hand, yeah. is the demand going to be there on the other side? I mean, we'll see. I know that, you know, when it comes to um, rental property that's not commercial, it's so depressed that I think you're starting to see a lot of artists move back into cities. They had been priced out. The same yeah. thing could happen on the commercial space. It's as so you're true. Saying that where a small business takes advantage of depressed real estate costs. And we have a thriving sort of culture again in some cities that have become a little bit homogeneous in the way. Oh that my they God. Yeah, I, mean, I, I talked about it during, in my book, youth nation, how um, five sixty state street is in a, is in a, is a rhyme by Jay Z in one of the songs. Yeah. He had to sell drugs out of there to support his family, right? Now, 560 State Street is across the street from the multi-billion dollar Barclays Center where the Brooklyn Nets play, which Jay-Z was a part owner of. And if you wanted a condo there now, it's in the millions of dollars. It's just that. So that's gentrification, right? That happened. But there was a process to get there. And the process to get there is New York City was too expensive. The artists... And, and the kind of cultural influencers uh, and people who wanted to come up with cool cupcake concepts moved to Brooklyn. They moved to Williamsburg, right? And they started to create these cool businesses. And then what happened? The youth followed. And then next thing you know, you know, you see an Apple store and a Starbucks pop up there and the cycle just keeps spreading out and the livable boundaries get pushed out further. This could be a reset for that in, a, in New York City, for example. Um, so, and, and I think in other markets, it's good, like Austin, it's going to facilitate Austin to look like New York because, you know, a lot of people are moving in there so there there's no depressed cost it's just the demand and miami it's out of control right so i think it's gonna th this recovery and especially when it comes to retail is going to take different shapes city by city yeah what a great really interesting um so health and wellness obviously has been front and center for consumers during the pandemic because every day they're reading about you know people getting hospitalized and they're reading about vaccines and they're reading about um respirators and all these things that we never really wanted to hear about and now it's it's in our face that, you know, we are all mere mortals, right? And we need to take care of ourselves. And, you know, you see companies that are in supplements or vitamins um, just explode during the pandemic. And we talked about Peloton. So health and wellness is front and center now, um, you know, in a way that it wasn't. You see companies like oat milk and, you know, exploding. And and so it, it's, a, it's a big deal. The question is, what's the form factor of health and wellness coming out of it? And the last part of it, obviously, is, is, is doctors and medicine and pharmaceuticals, which is just a massive space. One of the last major spaces to kind of hold out in digital disruption, which we'll talk about in a bit. So kind of what does that all mean coming out of this with what we've seen? Um, obviously the rise in, in virtual well-being um, has been explosive. You see companies like Teladoc allow people to see doctors, uh, companies like Calm that allow you to do, um, you know, online uh, therapy and meditation have exploded. And obviously companies like GoodRx, where you can uh, no longer have to go to a, um, you know, a, a pharmacy to get your, your medications, it gets sent to you. This whole world has been transformed really out of um, these companies having no choice, right? All of a sudden you see the Walgreens and CVSs of the world really accelerate their digital go to market because they had no other choice, right? Because all of a sudden, if they didn't, they would be, they, they wouldn't be in business. And this really has accelerated digital disruption in the space. A third of people prioritizing their own health and wellness over work or personal demands. It makes sense. I mean, also, again, people have more time. So now a lot of people have the luxury to do both. They can 
spend more time taking care of themselves um, and and work just as much because they're not commuting, they're not traveling for work. Of course, I think the remote work has taken its toll on mental health um, in a big way, which is a whole different um, you know subject. Um, but consumers know that health is now the most important thing. Uh, they feel comfortable now interacting with their doctor or healthcare services through video conferencing, it's something that again in the past was seen as something that was very alternative. And now you with platforms like Teladoc, you know, many uh, instances where somebody will visit a doctor, they don't have to do anymore. They're doing it from their home and a doctor is able to diagnose them remotely. And it has had a transformative effect um, on the medical space. Um, so, you know, obviously things are going more digital in health and wellness. Things are coming with more of an expectation of personalization. I think with all this becomes uh, a new realm of privacy concerns for consumers. Because when you're talking about the health and wellness space, I think personal privacy and data privacy is incredibly important as well. So, Jeff, what do you think some of the most, I, I guess, pivotal trends that came out of the last year in the health and wellness space are that will have implications towards the future? I mean, I think the term we saw on that one slide is a big one, personalization. I mean, that's really been where I think the health healthcare space has wanted to move for a very long period of time, but maybe has been slower to move there, Matt, you know, regulation, the need to adopt a lot of digital technology, maybe they didn't think they would get the scale that they can get now uh, from people saying, hey, I don't necessarily want to go and schedule an appointment, a physical appointment with the, the doctor, I just have questions for the doctor, could we do that virtually? I think if people are more comfortable with that, knowing that there's uh, you know, privacy rules that are set in place there. I mean, why wouldn't someone want to take advantage of that? I think that's like an important way that we get into a mode of, uh, you know, monitoring ourselves and taking care of ourselves rather than going to a doctor when we're sick, which is unfortunately how much of, you know, our society has operated. So this is, I think, a welcome area that could be, you know, really, really interesting that, that has uh, a, a lot of implications moving forward in terms of, you um, you know, growth in this area of, you know, how to, how to personalize healthcare a little bit more. Absolutely. And I know Jeff, we were talking about this yesterday, but you know, the, the medical space has been one of the last spaces to really face digital disruption. Uh, you know, you had, you know, industries like the music industry, where one day you saw CDs at Walmart when you walked in and the next day, you know, after you saw all these new music streaming startups and then which morphed into platforms like iTunes and Spotify, CDs are no longer, right? Digital disruption hit the music industry hard. Then it did the same with uh, the movie industry. And, and you saw us go from DVDs being in front of Walmart to Netflix and everything streaming. Um, and on and on and on is industry by industry got kind of completely reinvented from the inside out through digital. And I think going into this pandemic, there were still some holdouts. There are still some huge industries. And they're, they're usually industries that, first of all, are protected by sort of sleepy legacy incumbents or industries that are highly regulated, right? But mostly they're industries where disruption hurts the people who are running it, because if the disruption happened, it'd be a transfer of wealth from the, from the old establishment to the new establishment. So people are holding on. And some of those industries obviously are financial services, for example. And, you know, there's tremendous deregulation by the Trump uh, administration um, in financial services. And you saw a rise of fintech. And now you're seeing a whole new world as it comes to crypto um, and it comes to NFTs and all these things that are happening that are really exciting in the financial space. Um, and, I, you, you know, the, the, um, the medical space is no different. You know, the, the doctors would never do an online visit because it would impact maybe what they can bill or what, what's the implication on the healthcare and all these things. And now you're seeing that be transformed. You're saying the same thing with real estate where, um, you know, everything is done online in terms of applying for mortgages and seeing um, houses. So all these legacy industries, they're going to be the next ones to fall, not fall, but be transformed. And I think there's going to be massive opportunities coming on the other side of that. I mean, I think one of the things you point out there, Matt, is, is interesting to look at, which is also, you know, most of the industries you you talked about used crowdsourcing in terms of new models. I mean, the big area that needs to be really looked at is and and will be difficult to change is the area of of insurance. That's been an old area that doesn't want to change. But you know, what happens if you basically start to have new models that you know sort of bypass those systems? I don't know if the health industry is really ready for what might be coming to it, but we'll see you know, what happens. 
Right, but his question is, is it about what the industry is ready for or is it about what the consumers demand? Yeah, it's what the consumers obviously want. It's what people really want. I think we've had this sentiment out there for you know quite a long time now in terms of you know, more options that are available to people in this when it comes to health and wellness. I think the pandemic definitely brought that out because even people were looking for more options on mental health and on other things that they could, uh, you know, utilize that, uh, you know, really weren't front and center before the pandemic. I mean, people didn't really like to talk a lot about mental health. They thought it was a stigma. I think that's an area now that we talk much more about because there's much more burnout and there's, you know, it's it's just like having physical health issues. So these things, I think, will change how you know we basically provide services moving forward. Yeah, you know what's interesting, Jeff? It's interesting how fast things can change when change is the only option. So, for example, when when COVID first hit, it was vaccines take five to seven years to develop, and here we are a year later. And you know, the president said this week that by May, there's going to be enough vaccines that have been tested to base you know to be tested to be safe and effective for the entire US population. But a year ago, it was five to seven years, and now it's one year. So it just shows that where there's a will, there's a way, that because the technological advancements are there. So there's no reason why accelerated disruption shouldn't happen in these legacy industries. The only reason they haven't is, again, it's been being held back. Um, and now it's going to be moving forward. Automot the automotive sector is another one where you're going to see, I think, the electric vehicle space explode um, coming out of this as well. So yeah. Um, so keeping it moving um, to our next category, technology, which really is more of a, I think, a horizontal versus a vertical, because as we just mentioned, technology really has seeped into every part of the business world and every part of culture and every part of society. But there certainly were technological disruptions, you know, galore during the pandemic that are going to have lasting implications on the consumer coming out of it. Uh, tech adoption excitement is growing rapidly, but people are also more concerned about privacy, social interaction, connection. The government is getting involved uh, with a lot of big tech in terms of uh, regulation and anti-competitive practices. It did feel like um, in 2020, um, things came to a head with big tech um, and its impact on business, on society, whether it's what happened with Twitter um, and the former president uh, Trump during the election where they basically took his account away and, and all of a sudden now Twitter is seen as a company that's an arbiter of censorship or maybe they're not depending upon what side you fall on. Um, you know, tech has been front and center now. It, it, you know, we relied on it for our, our well-being and our livelihood during the pandemic, and it's had massive shifts in the way that um, our entire world operates in a world that none of us probably really saw 20 years ago. Obviously, technology um, is amazing because it makes people's lives easier. Um, people feel cut off in the world if they don't have their smartphone devices. It's, you know, it's it's really an appendage, especially when you talk about Gen Z, that, you know, People ask all the time, what's the difference between millennials and Gen Z? And the answer is millennials are the first generation that grew up with the internet in the household. Gen Z is the first generation that grew up with the mobile in the household. And for Gen Z, you know, the, the, the smartphone is an appendage to their body, right? They can't survive without it. So um, it, it really has become so important. Um, a third of people believe they've been spending far too much time in front of their screens. I'm surprised it's not even more than that. Um, maybe some people like it, but I can tell you it's exhausting being in front of a screen. Not when I'm talking to you, of course, Jeff, but in a busy day, uh, it's pretty hard. Um, and people, I think, are in a lot of ways, are screened out, so to speak. They've they spent so much time inside staring at screens this year. The question is, are tech companies going to try to facilitate that rebalancing coming out of it. Uh, because the last thing we need coming out of this is more screen time. We've been um, inside probably more than we wanted to. And Jeff, tell me about cyber sickness. It was something that we uncovered during the study that I thought was interesting. Yeah. Describe what that is. So this is a term that we'll probably hear about more. It's actually from just being in front of your screen all the time, constantly having to rely on technology to do your day to day. And we know that the past year, that's really been the case for all of us. We've, um, you know, we're more tired probably because we are on video a lot more. Uh, we're more tired because we're constantly having to use, you know, sort of digital devices to do a lot of the things that, uh, you know, maybe there was a little bit more of a balance that was there in the past. So uh, this is an interesting area that I think can, you know, that, uh, you know, we have to look at uh, especially when it comes to not just what technology offers, but also any customer experience in any vertical and how they're using technology. Uh, you know, 
just because it exists doesn't necessarily mean we should design it that way for people to use it. So, uh, you know, I think back to a couple of years ago, you know, they're still in existence and they're used, Matt, when it comes to like chat bots. But sometimes, you know, people don't want to be, you know, disturbed by something that pops up on their screen. They just want to be able yeah. to get the right answer. And we have to think about that in terms of customer experience moving forward. Uh, you know, like, hey, do people really want to be interrupted by another pop up? Or do we just give yeah. them the contact information so they can solve the problem that they're looking to solve? And I think you had a great point yesterday when we were chatting just about you see something like Clubhouse exploding and Clubhouse doesn't involve screens, right? Like That's you right. can participate, it's audio. You're, it, you're not looking at each other. We, Clubhouse could just as well be, you know, video, group video chats, et cetera, but it's not. So tell me about why you think that's occurring with Clubhouse and how it's kind of, I guess, counterculture in some ways in a world where everything seems to be video now. I mean, I think it's, you know, people are sort of trying to figure out how to do things. You know, they're, they're, they're demanded with multitasking during the day. So they're trying to do a lot of different things. You know, you might be on a video call and they're still trying to like, you know, you know, design a document and, you know, meet deadlines here and there. And there's something just about audio, which allows for better, I think, multitasking. It's sort of reminiscent of having, you know, music on in the background or, you know, the radio playing in the background. But instead, maybe you're listening to someone talk about, you know, some particular subject matter and you're just listening in. It's, it's interesting rather than having to sort of follow along that conversation via text or our, our video. So I, I think these are just things that have, you know, always existed, but now there's companies moving into these areas because they realize the demands on people's time and, and the fact that they have to fixate on a screen. It's like, how do we lessen that so that it actually makes people, you know, uh, be able to do things that they need to do and, and, and not get so tired all the time. I think that's one thing that is, is unfortunate about uh, this past year is, we realize how 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 tiring technology may make us. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, in that regard, we kind of touched on this earlier. You know, many believe that the office will forever be changed. And you know, again, our company has been so incredibly efficient. If, when people ask me how is what what's gone on at Susie, you know, as you're it's gone great. We've been so incredibly efficient. You can go from one meeting to the next. You never have to leave, etc that comes at a cost, right? It comes at a cost of mental health. It comes at a cost of um, diminished trust and relationships because, you know, most of our employees have never met each other. You know, 70% of our employees never step foot in our office. So they don't even know what each other look like. And, you know, we have trust because we've spent a lot of time in person together. And if we haven't, my relationship with you would be completely different, right? And I think that trust breeds, um, you know, culture and culture is a secret secret weapon for companies and, and trust can, it's much harder to be formed, you know, or online. So, th so in my opinion, I think that offices need some type of physical presence to, to basically breed culture um, because as culture is so very important, but that's going to come at a, it's a balancing act because it's much more efficient. Some people do like working from home. Um, you know, you see some companies, I, I read this morning that uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, one of the biggest uh, commercial real estate um, tenants in New York City, is putting some of its space up on the market. Um, I was surprised by that um, because, you know, J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs and American Express, they're the biggest tenants. If they start to move out of New York, you really start to question commercial real estate. So what are your thoughts and what's going on at Microsoft with remote work? Are you guys planning on going to the office? I mean, I think like one of the things is we're planning for, uh, you know, I think a lot of this is still being mapped out, you know, what the hybrid workplaces look like. But yeah. the thing is, you know, Matt, before the pandemic, I, I worked from anywhere for, you know, I've been with the company for eight years and, you know, I worked, you know, you name it, I worked from it, whether it was an airport lounge to, but you've you know, always been on the bleeding home. edge, Jeff. That, that's been you. You've always uh, been on the bleeding edge. I, I guess. But, you know, those are things that I think we've gotten used to now is our office on a sort of device where we're able to, you know, do do that work where it's, you know, where it's necessary. I think the hybrid model is really important. I think this also straddles something that we talked about in retail, which, you know, Will there be a demand on physical meeting collaborative spaces moving forward where people can do business in person? As you said, trust is an important factor. We get most when we actually are meeting with other people. Uh, but it's not like a place that, you know, people have to rent all the time and pay right. like a 30 year rent on that. Right. Those models may change as well right. moving forward because of technology. So these are all things we have to think about. Um, 
you know, there's the, the list continues to grow here in terms of, you know, all the, all the, the changes that we have to think, you know, consider moving forward. Yeah. I mean, you raise a great point. I mean, the, the real estate industry is another industry that hasn't had much disruption. We start to see it with WeWork. They obviously had some of their stumbles, but the WeWork pay as you go model was appealing for many startups. Um, there's another great startup that was in the WeWork space called Notel, um, which went out of business basically. And they, it was just poor timing on their behalf. I thought what they were doing was great as well. That model could very well be much more in demand coming out of this because I, I think it, it is the hybrid model that allows companies to have an in-person presence, but you're not tying up millions of dollars in security deposits. You know, you're not basically getting an office for 10,000 square feet when you might need five or 100,000 square feet the next year. There's so much disruption in this space. Who wants to sign a seven-year lease right now? So I think the real estate industry is going to need to be reactive, but also lean into their strengths, which is essentially they are a conduit to get people together, build culture, build relationships. And if I were in commercial real estate, I would be playing that up. It's not about the value of an office. It's about the value of trust and culture. That's really that, that's why offices exist, in my opinion. Um, and that's why it's going to be a big part of our future uh, moving forward, at Susie, for sure. Um, so let's talk about financial services again. You mentioned it quickly earlier, another uh, you know, industry that for so long has been controlled by you know, what we call fat, happy bankers on Wall Street. And you know, th it was always about the institutions making all their money when the retail investor and Main Street got holding the bag. We saw a couple of years ago the whole Occupy Wall Street movement where people were sick about the hedge fund billionaires while um, you know, people were struggling. And you know, over the last month or so, we've seen the shift occur where the power dynamic in the financial services and banking space has been shifting from big institutions where, you know, the big banks, the treasury, et cetera, to individuals, people on Reddit pumping up stocks to basically create short squeezes on multi-billion dollar hedge funds and currencies like um, Bitcoin and Ethereum essentially being built from the bottom up, not from the top down and having, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of value to the extent where now you have uh, the, the, the treasury heads uh, talking about and the Federal Reserve talking about is crypto a real currency or not. So it's now the, the financial services are being driven from the sidewalks no longer the boardroom. So you have this collision happening. And at the same time, you have incredible new startups like Square um, that are making it easier for small businesses to accept credit cards and Brex that's making it easier for um, companies to borrow money and on and on and on. A firm that's a whole new financing model um, that's a big partner of Peloton. So the disruption of financial spaces is, is huge. And it's such a big opportunity for companies really in all industries. Because if you, no matter what, if you're in business, you're selling things. How are you selling things? How are consumers transferring um, currency from themselves to you for your product or service? So this really matters for everyone. Um, uh, at the same time, there's personal finance. Consumers are trying to gain control of their finances, uh, when to spend. As we mentioned, uh, savings are at all time high, uh, but consumers still find that they don't have full control of their financial future. I think when this first started, the pandemic started, people were saying, is this the next great depression? You know, do you have enough money? There was talking about a run on the banks and, and people stocking up on food. So that really kind of, I think, impacted consumers in terms of thinking about their financial future um, and well-being. 40% of respondents are putting money aside to save for things they can't afford right now. Um, I believe that coming out of this, we are going to see also a huge um, boom of luxury purchases and big ticket purchases. We're, we've already seen it with the housing market. The housing market has exploded. Um, it hasn't been this hot since 2006 um, because interest rates dropped to an all-time low. Um, it's not the case anymore, but they were at all-time lows, which drove up a massive um, boom in the housing market. I think you're, we're going to see it in the auto space that we talked about. I think the luxury goods space is also going to take off coming out because consumers have been saving up money. Um, but getting a hold on finances, financial literacy, it's with all this disruption happening, it's, it's incredibly important. And the last thing I'll say is everyone's getting the financial space. Now you see Walmart uh, sharpening their fintech uh, focus and, and they're looking to figure out, can Walmart create a bank? And, and obviously there's Apple Pay and, and there's PayPal and all these companies that are sort of entering the space. So tons of disruption. What sticks out to you, Jeff, is some of the big lasting trends that are going to be coming out of this crazy world we've seen in the financial services and really the financial market space overall. I mean, I think the big one is all of us, 
do transactions of whatever of some type with whatever business we're in. But uh, the question is, especially with consumer facing models, you know, what are those payments that you offer people? It's great that, you know, you can pay with credit card, but now we're starting to see payment plan options. We're starting to see much more biometric payments, uh, the ability to Venmo. Uh, those are things I think we have to think about, especially depending on who our consumer base is um, and what they're, what they're comfortable with. I, yeah. I'm still fascinated with a lot of companies who are unwilling to add different payment models and make it difficult for the the, the consumer to you know to pay, to pay for those services or those materials. That just moves people to look for alternatives. So I think that you know we're in an area now where payment models are you know front and center in terms of the you know financial services industry. Absolutely. Um, I also think obviously cryptocurrency is not going away anytime soon is going to be, it's just going to be that thing that doesn't go away. Um, I think cryptocurrency is something, it's a classic example of the technology adoption curve. You know, five years ago, it was almost like it, it was something that was hot and, and it spiked and everyone was talking about it. And then it went away. People stopped hearing about Bitcoin for a couple of years. And the reason why is the initial hype wore off and the real work began. And people start to figure out what are the real applications of the blockchain and of cryptocurrency. And now here we are in 2021 and it's come roaring back because it's ready for application society. So I think it's definitely a lesson learned. The same thing happened with e-commerce in 2000. There was pets.com and all these e-commerce companies that you know got overvalued, really didn't have the infrastructure or demand, but it was sort of like a, almost like a genetic marker for things to come. You know, they implode it and then out came Amazon and, and, and all their other, um, you know, counterparts, which have basically redefined the commerce space. So I think it's definitely, there's, tre there's themes there that I think are applicable to almost every industry where you'll see these new trends will go away because the real work begins and they come roaring back. Um, so, uh, this has been great. Um, so we're going to go to questions, but before we do, um, if anybody wants the full report, uh, which is the Microsoft Advertising State of the Five Consumer Report uh, in partnership with Suzy, uh, you can download it. There is a link um, on the handout section of your screen. So if you click that, you can uh, download the report. Um, and of course, you can reach out to us uh, if you have any questions. And if you want to learn more about Microsoft Advertising, we're happy to connect you with Jeff and his colleagues there. Um, but I think we're going to see Abel now. Um, again, who saved me today. Um, and uh, we're going to go into some questions. Awesome. Uh, all right. So first question for you, a lot of people are curious. We talked about this um, need that people want to support small businesses and kind of how most people are actually going to big box. Um, so for some of those smaller businesses who just don't have that digital infrastructure, uh, they don't have the capital to create experiences, like what advice do you have for them, Matt, uh, about how they can really kind of navigate through these, these difficult waters? in terms of just having the right infrastructure to be able to go digital? To go digital or create experiences within their kind of in-person in places. Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately it all rests with what, what's the, what is the unmet need of your consumer, right? So you so every, every business service is a consumer and depending upon what category you are, that consumer difference and their needs difference, it gets, but regardless, they all have unmet needs. So for example, if I was selling pet food, you know, an unmet need right now, I would think is a place for people to be able to bring their pets coming out of this to allow their pets to play with other pets and, and kind of uh, reignite that social dialogue between pet owners that we didn't have. So I would invest in some type of experience like a, like a dog track where dogs can run around and, you know, subsidize it, you'll sell more pet food and you're bringing owners together. So that's a, that's a high level example, but you're identifying an unmet need that's accelerated during the pandemic and you're coming in and you're helping to solve that. need. So I think ultimately when it's about experiences and content and things that are really about the consumer first, you have to focus on the unmet needs. Where do you have a right to play and then try to come in and solve some of those unmet needs? Definitely. Um, uh, next question here is really for Jeff. So um, obviously we talk a lot about the fact that offices and kind of working um, remotely or working in person is going to look dramatically different. So um, kind of curious from your perspective, Jeff, obviously Microsoft having a very big footprint in kind of office environments. What are you, how are you guys talking about it kind of internally and where do you guys really see that, that going? Yeah, I think the best thing is, you know, are the things that have been discussed is, you know, how do you get the most out of or, or what and what the pandemic has opened is this discussion around what, you know, how do you get the most out of a out of a person, you know, in the past, 
um, it was it was one rule. You you had to be at the office at a certain time. You had to stay till a certain time. You had to basically use uh, whatever the company provided. But if you think about it, that's also because technology sort of required you to be there. You had to have a phys- there was a physical phone on the desk there. There may have been a computer that you couldn't take anywhere with you because it was basically a desktop. You know, mobility has allowed people to do their best work, you know, really from anywhere. That said, there's always discussions, too, on, you know, how do you get groups of people together so that you can bond? As Matt said, you know, how do you build a culture? You have to, you know, you you have to sort of, you know, build in things that aren't always about work, but about understanding the people that you work with. So I think there's a lot of practices that are ha- that that we're doing where it's like you know hey how do we understand the people that we work with how do we empathize with them uh, and that way we can sort of figure out the best way that we can work moving forward whether that's you know in the office a few days a week talking to others or somewhere else where we can do deep work I think one of the things missing from the office environment is the the idea of deep work. Everyone thinks that you're just supposed to scramble around and do little things here and there. And that's not how work really, that's not how you get to any big development. Deep work is actually fixating on something and working on it for a very long period of time. And that means less distraction. And I think that's where we're sort of moving when it comes to, uh, you know, the the future of work uh, post pandemic. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and maybe just one final question for both of you all, kind of going through this report, what, what's probably the most surprising thing that you guys each found? Um, do you, you want, I can go first there. I, I think the biggest one is, um, you know, there's been a lot of discussions on the, in the past, um, you know, pre-pandemic on how purpose is a really big part of uh, of uh, business culture, but, you know, we tend to forget that humans, you know, they need, they, when they need things, they can be, they can sort of, you know, be selfish and selfishly motivated. And what we've seen is, you know, even though people say they support small business, they're really using what's convenient to them. And it would, that, uh, that shouldn't have surprised me, but it did. Um, I, I, I was going to say that, <laughs> but I think <laughs> thing that definitely surprised me is just, how conscious consumers seem to be about the impact of technology on their mental well-being, um, where it's just front and center right now, where consumers need a shift. They need a shift away from the screens. They need to be in the real world. They need personal connection, human interaction. They need to get out and travel and do things. And that just came up loud and clear in so many of the individual industries that we dove deep into. Definitely. Uh, actually, maybe one final question for you, Matt. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about Susie and kind of the where that that um, you know panel audience came from that was responding to some of the research? Sure. Yep. So for those of you who uh, are new to Susie, Susie is a, a market research software tool that enables brands to be able to conduct on-demand uh, market research uh, from whatever audience that matters the most. Uh, we have our own proprietary U.S. consumer panel that's weighted for um, census weighted amongst key census-based criteria, so companies can get nationally representative feedback to help them make better, more informed decisions. Of course, driven by the consumer, which as you know, is more important than ever before, given all the changes that we talked about today. Awesome. Well, that's that's really all the questions that we have here, but thank awesome. you both so much for this discussion. Thank you, it was great. Thank you to everyone at Able. Thanks as always to you and your team, KD, the whole team for putting this together. Jeff, can't thank you enough for your partnership. It's been great working with you on the study. We'll have, uh, let's make it an annual thing if you're down with that. Um, always so many other things that we can uncover and I always enjoy my time with you and to everyone who takes the time to join today out of your busy schedules we really appreciate it so on behalf of myself and Jeff um, and the team at Suzy thanks everyone stay safe and hope to see everyone in person real soon take care everyone